Summary and Conclusion In presenting the foregoing information, I have attempted to acquaint you with just a small part of the rich heritage of the Church that Christians have ignored for centuries simply because they have considered it too primitive or unsophisticated for modern categories of thought. However, of all the documents of the early Church, these works contain some of the most relevant information for our time. Furthermore, there is much more information we can and will cull from the writings of the early church fathers in days and years to come. First, I introduced you to Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp, who is best known for his monumental 2nd century work, Against Heresies, in which he based his refutation of Christian heretics on one simple premise. The church received its understanding of the scriptures from the apostles as a tradition that had been handed down from one generation of church leaders to the next. He forcefully argued the leaders of the church in his time agreed there was only one teaching. The heretics, on the other hand, agreed on little. They disclosed themselves to be heretics by the fact that they held no common teaching. In Irenaeus, we found an individual who was highly unlikely to have intentionally modified the teaching in any way. Then I introduced you to Hippolytus, a disciple of Irenaeus. In his treatise on Christ and Antichrist, which he wrote for the benefit of his disciple Theophilus, he expressed the same view of the ministry as his teacher, Irenaeus. In this letter, he admonished Theophilus to find other godly believers to whom he could teach the things he had been taught. In so doing, he quoted the admonishment of Paul to his disciple Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 1 through 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. So it was obvious Hippolytus was likewise not an individual who would have been likely to distort the apostolic tradition he had received from his teacher, Irenaeus. Therefore we logically inferred that the things Irenaeus and Hippolytus have to say concerning the Antichrist must reflect those things the Apostle John taught Polycarp. If that be so, and its accuracy can hardly be denied without denying the very foundations of Christianity, then we should treat what they have to say with the utmost respect. That is all the more imperative because in the book of Revelation, their spiritual father, the Apostle John, describes a series of visions he saw in which the final events of history are described symbolically. Those visions include a description of the events leading up to and including the reign of the Antichrist. Here is a summary of the pertinent things these two men, Irenaeus and Hippolytus, have said about the Antichrist who will reign on the earth before the return of Jesus Christ. Irenaeus, Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapters 19 through 30. Irenaeus argued that the multiplicity of Christian doctrine has its source in Satan, the liar. Satan has promoted false teaching in the church because he seeks to be worshipped as God. Through false doctrine, he has managed to divert the worship of men from the God who is and focus it on a God who exists only in the minds of the heretics. By distorting the ideas men have about God, Satan is able to channel the worship of God to himself. He can claim that worship as his own because such people are not actually worshiping God. They are worshiping a figment of their imagination. Therefore, as far as Irenaeus is concerned, the heretics, although they claim to worship God, actually worship Satan. Irenaeus goes on to say, that the events of the final days will demonstrate the great lengths to which Satan will go in his attempt to be worshipped as God. He will come as a man, the Antichrist, for the specific purpose of being proclaimed the messianic king of the Jews. He will then set himself forth as God and take his seat in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, leading astray those who worship him as if he were Christ. 
Irenaeus clearly states the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel and mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24:15 is Satan sitting in the rebuilt temple of God in Jerusalem, pretending to be God. He indicates that event will take place in the middle of the final seven-year period, week, before the return of Jesus Christ. Irenaeus understands the Antichrist will rise up as a little horn among ten kings that rule over ten nations that issue forth from the ancient Roman Empire. The Antichrist will slay three rulers of those ten, Irenaeus doesn't say which three, and be an eighth among the remaining seven. Although these seven rulers give their power to the beast, which is the revived Roman Empire, they will not be completely united, and therefore will ultimately come to ruin. Their complete destruction will occur at the time of the return of Jesus Christ. One significant thing to note about Irenaeus' discussion of the Antichrist is the fact that it is part of a much larger discussion in which he explains how and why Satan deceives mankind. He states that Satan is anxious to be adored as God and wishes himself to be proclaimed as king. His point is that Satan will achieve these goals during his reign as the Antichrist. He specifically says that in passing off his ultimate deception on the world in the person of the Antichrist, Satan will pretend to be the Christ and set himself forth as God. A second significant element in Irenaeus's discussion is the fact that he understands the Antichrist will appear in the middle of the final week and will reign for just three and one-half years. He will suddenly manifest himself while many in the church are proclaiming peace and safety, and he will, during his reign, bring about a total destruction of the earth. He and the other seven rulers with him will lay Babylon waste and burn her with fire and put the church to flight. By this last statement, Irenaeus indicates he understands the body of Christ. True believers will be made to endure the Antichrist's persecution. Hippolytus, Treatise on Christ and Antichrist In his Treatise on Christ and Antichrist, Hippolytus put together an explanation of the topic for the benefit of his disciple Theophilus. His teacher, Irenaeus, had explained the manifestation of the Antichrist from the perspective of Satan's desire to be worshipped as God and rule as king, first over the Jews, but ultimately over the entire world. Hippolytus, however, explained it as Satan's desire to make himself like Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There is not necessarily any contradiction between their two viewpoints. Christians have always understood that Jesus Christ is God. Furthermore, both men understand Satan will take his seat as a man in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, seeking to be worshipped as God and pretending to be the legitimate messianic king of the Jews, that is, Jesus Christ. Hippolytus gives a list of those ways in which Satan will, as the Antichrist, make himself like Jesus Christ. In parabolic terminology, he says the Antichrist will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem to emulate the fact that Jesus Christ built the house of God through his resurrection. The Antichrist will also become a king, the king of the Jews, patterning himself after Jesus Christ, the legitimate messianic king of Israel. When the Antichrist appears, he will make himself like the Son of God and set himself forward as king. After defeating the three horns out of the ten, which Hippolytus again identifies as Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia, and subjugating the remaining seven, the Antichrist will begin to be lifted up in heart and to exalt himself against God as the master of the whole world, and his first expedition will be against Tyre and Beirut. After that, when the three horns are cut off, he will begin to show himself as God. At that time, he will begin to dispatch missives against the saints, commanding to cut them all off everywhere on the ground of their refusal to reverence and worship him as God. By saints, Hippolytus clearly means true believers because he elsewhere calls this the persecution which is to fall upon the church from the adversary. 
The persecution of true believers will last for the last half of the final week, the 1,203 score days, the half the week, during which the tyrant is to reign and persecute the church, which flees from city to city and seeks concealment in the wilderness among the mountains, possessed of no other defense than the two wings of the great eagle, that is to say, the faith of Jesus Christ. In all this, Hippolytus agrees with all that we found written by his teacher, Irenaeus. Conclusion I pray the words of the early church fathers have made you reconsider the dispensational doctrine that you have most likely been taught is true. My hope is you will recognize the fallacy inherent in slavish commitment to the oral traditions of men and seek to learn more about the oral tradition that Jesus handed down to the apostles. And my earnest prayer for you is that you will turn to God, confess your failure to live only for Him, and ask Him to help you understand the truth you will need to be able to stand in days to come. Then, may God grant you the wisdom to follow the admonition of the Apostle Paul. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure.